All right, it's official now. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you all for coming today. Like I say, my name is Mike Lagerquist. I'm here with Mind, Faith, and Action. And I learned about Frank a month and a half or so ago. I think he was featured in the free press because he came and spoke at the Mankato Brewery. And who can pass up a chance to go see a, a forensic psychologist at the brewery, right? <laughs> so I went down there and, uh, and learned even more about him by that time. We had been in communication that morning about five times, and we had them booked for our Vine Author Series, which continues to draw a good crowd today. And I will tell you, Alan Eskins is a tough one to beat. He had across the, the hallway here, he had about 100 people come to see him a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. But we continue to draw. This is probably the second largest crowd that we've had for it. So um, Frank is a, as I said, a forensic psychologist. That is his day job. He's still doing that. As a matter of fact, he works with a company right here in Mankato, so was able to, to combine these two things, but he'll probably talk about that. So before I start going into his talk, I will just ask if you can, if your phone is on, if you can silence that. Oh, great. Um, and we will continue to welcome people in as the as the talk begins. There is a point where he might ask for a volunteer. It's not anything that's going to bring, come to criminal charges or anything. <laughs> But if you would like to volunteer, he will tell you more about that as well. So I will step aside and introduce you to Frank Weber, clinical or forensic psychologist and true crime author. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm Frank Weber. I'm a forensic psychologist, which means I'm the guy who gets called in when homicide and sexual assault cases come in doing interviews of suspects and things of that sort. So I've been called in by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to uh, uh, profile cold case homicides. I actually narrated a show on the Oxygen Channel titled Murder by Morning. And my latest book, Burning Bridges, is going to be featured on an oxygen show called Snapped, which talks about real crime cases. Um, whenever I hear someone speak, I apologize if I look goofy, I feel goofy I'm wearing a mask and I usually don't wear a headset and okay. But uh, whenever I hear someone speak, I always want to know why they're neurotic like they are. So I'm gonna tell you that about me right away. Um, my dad's job when he was in the military was to keep track of all the military equipment in the world on a three by five card, three by five cards in a building in Sacramento, California. So this is before computers. So everything had to be organized and labeled. And so I grew up in a home where everything was labeled. And I mean, everything was labeled. I remember being in the bathroom and looking over at the toll bar, which said toll bar on it. <laughs> and uh, thinking, what else could it possibly be? Do like real small people come in and do chin ups? Um, so I'm one of 10 kids named in alphabetical order. So I am F, the sixth letter of the alphabet. Um, yeah. But my dad was a good guy, I and I actually that I tell people I was raised to be obsessive, and that sort of helps me with my work because I'm very good at keeping track of details. Um, so how did I end up being a forensic psychologist? I teach a college class part time, which I've done since I was 25 years old, and I tell college students just to head in the direction because you don't really know what you're going to be doing. My job didn't exist when I was in high school, so how do you plan for it? Um, but you head in the direction, and then you end up sifting and sorting from there, and you end up in an occupation. Um, so I graduated from college, and I was going to be a teacher, um, maybe coach basketball. But the first year of teaching, my daughter was born, her stomach wasn't fully developed, and the school didn't have insurance that covered that. And so we we're going thousands of dollars in debt. So I had to get a uh, test into a job with the state because they have better insurance and I needed that coverage. So I tested into a job as a behavior analyst. And when I got there, I remember asking one of my coworkers, so what's the easiest job here for the most amount of money? And he said, clinical psychologist. And I said, that's what I'm gonna be. Um, <laughs> but people who know me, I'm very intense, I work hard. And so I ended up getting back, getting my degree in clinical psychology. And I got a degree in a large mental health clinic. I got a job in a large mental health clinic. And I initially worked with victims. I thought I could work with victims victims, but I don't really want to work with offenders. But I was helping these victims and the offenders program, those guys didn't even show up and nobody did anything about it. And that really bugged me because uh, 
they were court ordered to be there. They damn well should be there. So I started complaining to people in the Department of Corrections about it. And they said, well, what would you do different? And I said, I can think of four things off the top of my head. One, um, I'd invite their probation or parole officer right to this clinic. They don't show up, you issue a warrant and they're arrested. The court ordered to be here, they should be here. Two, I make them do couples counseling because a lot of those guys were in relationships with women and have no idea of the offenses they've committed and they should know that. Three, I make them take a class in healthy relationships. 60% of all sex offenses committed in Minnesota and across the United States are committed by people who didn't graduate from high school. And so even though you have them in every occupation, we have them way more with a certain part of our population. And if you tell those people to develop a healthy relationship, they don't have a clue, they've never been around one. And so they need some basic information. And finally, I do lie detector tests or polygraph examinations because I want something other than the therapist's opinion that they're really doing okay and they're not offending. And so then they asked if I would develop a program. So I developed a program and uh, in the Furtado, Medina counties and Staples, small area of the United States of Minnesota. And then within a year, the counties around St. Cloud asked if I would develop a program for them. And the counties around Brainerd and then Marshall and Mankato and Rochester, Alexandria, Grand Rapids, Wilmer. And now the program that I started back then serves 70 of the 87 counties in Minnesota. And so that's, that was the program I started 27 years ago. And we have an office here. We have offices in Brainerd, St. Cloud, and Mankato. Um, and it's not just, you know, it's not that I wanted to be big or I wanted to do it a long time. I just wanted it to be done well. And so one of the things, I'm a big advocate of accountability. People should be accountable for their behavior. And so uh, I've asked the Department of Corrections every year to take a look at the graduates from our program. And I want to find out how many are real family because I don't want to do something if it's not working. And in the 27 years we've done this program, 97% of the offenders who graduated from the program have never been convicted of an offense again. And so we have great success, but we're very intense. And no other program in the state, by the way, turns in data to the Department of Corrections on that. I think everybody should, but that's just me. Okay. So I'm doing this work and I'm getting called into more and more intense cases, been to every prison and jail in the state. And so what do you do with that information? It's like, okay, you spend your day talking to a serial rapist. You can't come home and say to your wife and kids, hey, guess what I did today? You know, you traumatize the entire family. And so uh, um, I just started writing. I like a great mystery. And I'm not... I like the way Hitchcock did it. Hitchcock said the thrill is in the anticipation, not in the gore. And that's how I write, that I like a good mystery. And so I took true crime cases and I wrote them and put them in a three ring binder in the closet. And I did that for years. And then finally in 2016, I took my first book, murder book, and I sent it to a publisher. And uh, they contacted me back and said, well, who's your target audience? And I said, well, me, I wrote it to Bent. And they just started laughing. They said, this is going to sell. You should start on a sequel. And so then I started on a sequel. Um, and it's just taken off from there. And so I've tried to do one a year since then. Um, so 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21. This is actually the back of Burning Bridges. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little about covers, though, because I was very, you know, I didn't understand this industry at all when I got my first book. Published. So the publisher picks me up and says, okay, we love the book, we can publish it. They didn't change anything about the story, but they sent me this cover of a forest and a lake. And he said, here's your cover. And I said, ah, I don't really like it. And he said, it doesn't make any difference. Now that we have your book, we have the final say on it. And uh, um, so I argued a little more with them. They said, well, what do you want? And I said, I want a young woman waiting for a ride. And they said, well, send us a picture. And so I don't have the picture. It's just a thought in my head. They said, okay, we'll go to the cover. I said, I'll send you the picture. So I got a photographer to take this picture. Um, this is Jenny Brenny. She's actually a child protection worker in Benton County. Now, none of these people are a uh, model for a living. So I had this picture taken, sent it to the publisher. The publisher says, well, we still like our picture better. And I said, okay, I know you have, and first of all, they were giving me grief because 
I said, you've never been published before. We're a publisher. This is your first book. And keep you telling us we're doing our job wrong. And I said, well, this is very important to me. And uh, so I said, let's do this. Let's go to a large book club in Minneapolis. And we'll set my cover on the table. And you'll we'll set your cover on the table. We'll ask everybody to walk out with one picture and see what they have. Every person had that picture. And then they said, okay, you get your covers. And the reason that was so significant to me is it's the psychology of it. Think of it, when you walk into a bookstore, you don't pick up every book. Something about a cover catches your eye and you pick up the book. And I can write the best book in the world, but if nobody picks it up and looks at the back, I can't sell it. And so that's why the cover is so significant. The other thing, and I'm actually changing from this with my next book, but uh, you notice there's a lot of young women on the cover of these. Part of it is when I was in college, I did some work at a bookstore. And one of the things that intrigued me is women tended to pick up mysteries with women on the cover, and men tended to pick up mysteries with women on the cover, but for different reasons. I, I recently spoke on a panel with Dr. Amanda Vickery from the Booth, researches true crime from the University of Illinois. And she said 90% of women will buy a, a book with a woman on the cover, a mystery, and because they want to identify with a character in there and understand that. And, under, and men, 60% will buy uh, one with a woman on the cover. It's less significant to them, and most of the time when they say so, it's because, well, it's attractive women. So, so anyway, so I, I just went with characters where I thought were significant to the book. And it's funny, once you get published and people want to keep telling you this is what you should do, that every cover should have a young woman on it. Well, my next one doesn't. It has a young man on it, actually. And, uh, um, and the reason young is because so many of the offenses I deal with are that age group, that this is what the stories are about. They're significant characters in the book. And people said, well, after my first two books, you should always have murder in the title. I said, yeah, I'm not doing that. And then after Last Call, Lying Close, Burning Bridges, they said, well, you should always have tour titles. I said, yeah, I'm not doing that either. <laughs> but, uh, um, why? I don't need to. I don't need to paint myself into a corner. I'm going to do what's best for the book. I'm going to do the best cover. I'm going to do the best title. And that's it. So this is Alicia Isom. She's a child protection worker in uh, Crow Wing County. She refers a lot of clients to me. What was funny about this one is when I asked her, I said, because you look like the person in the story. And I said, this, I know it's weird to ask someone who refers clients to you to, if you want to be on the cover of a book. And she just started laughing. And she said, you're going to make my mom's life. And she says, my mom always said, you should have been a model. And I said, I'm good with being a social worker. Now I can tell her I've been on the cover of a book. It's good enough. <laughs> um, and this is Alicia Isom. She's my Serena character on these two books. Um, she uh, actually works at labor in a pellet plant. They make pellets for grills, and she's also an artist. This is Chloe Kapsner, her family farms in rural Minnesota. She was Morrison County Dairy Princess um, this summer and uh, uh, valedictorian, and this is Elise again, the Serena character. Um, just a couple things. So I have some fun with these. And like this one, she's actually taking a lie detector test. If you look closely, once it's all set up, and it's running, let me shot that cover. That's this machine, it's running, and you're gonna see these are neuro tubes here and here. She's got a blood pressure cup on, she's got things on her fingers, and that's why you're getting the lines on it. Um, Okay, a little about the books. Murder book, my first book, I wrote about, um, it was a case that happened in northern Minnesota. 13-year-old's walking home, and she disappears. And a small town, walking down a dirt road from one farm to the next, did that walk many times. Um, also, so an investigator gets sent there to take a look at it. And then this investigator was sent to that place because he grew up in that area. I just realized I stepped off the screen. Um, so he grew, because he grew up in that area. And uh, what happened when he was in high school, a girl he dated disappeared. And uh, that motivated him to be an investigator. And so when he gets there, he reopens that missing case and ends up solving both cases. But it's a very interesting story actually um, got that from an investigator I worked with from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension named Dick Plotnick. Um, and so you learn about things unique to Minnesota, like that happened in this case, like a 
with the mammalian diving body in Minnesota is submerged under cold water, you can revive it even if it's been there for 20 or 30 minutes because uh, the blood, everything stops before the person drowned because of the cold water. And so there's some really interesting things with that. Um, okay. Also, just to share this story, when I wrote this book and then they offered to publish it, I thought, I don't even know if I should publish it it's because <laughs> there's a lot of personal stuff in the book also. And, uh, and then I thought, well, everybody's going to think it's fiction, so it doesn't make any difference. Um, but uh, some funny things about this. Okay, the character, you know, I mentioned that the person that dated someone who disappeared when they were in high school, that happened to me. Now, my story has a good ending. I'll just tell you that. That uh, it was before my senior year, I was invited to a party and uh, by this girl from Little Falls. I get there, she leaves right away, so I don't know anybody. So I ended up talking to this girl who didn't seem to know a lot of people, and we agreed to go on a couple of dates. Then school started, and I was busy with football and music and academics. I was just busy. And so I said, okay, I'm just too busy to be in a relationship right now. It's just not a good time for me to date. She said, okay. So she calls me a week later and says, let's talk about this. So I talk about it again. And I just say, it's just, I'm busy. I'm sorry. And then she calls me a week later and says, I just think we should just talk about it one more time. So I drive in and I talk to her and I said, okay, this has to be painful for you. It's painful for me. We've gone out five times. We broke up three times that uh, we just got to stop talking. And so a couple of weeks go by, we're not talking. And uh, I went to the small school called Pierce. She went to Little Falls. So I asked some people I knew Little Falls and asked, how's she doing in school? And they said, well, she's not in school. I said, where is she? Nobody knows where she is. And uh, um, so this is landline days. So I call and no answer. I drive into their home and it's like a Stephen King movie. You get there and the house is empty. The family's gone, nobody's there. So I asked the neighbors and they, and they had just moved into the area and then they moved out again, they were gone. Nobody knows where they went. And so months go by, I have no idea what happened to this person. And people would come up to me and say, hey, what happened to that girl you were dating? I don't know, what do you mean you don't know? Well, where is she, I don't know. <laughs> and. Uh, I grew up with some rougher friends, and one of my friends used to, if I was talking to a girl after that, would say, you know, the last girl we dated disappeared, and nobody knows where she is. <laughs> um, but then finally at Christmas time, I'm in Little Falls at the rock dance, and she comes walking in and says, hey, do you want to dance? <laughs> and I said, you want to talk? And she said, no, let's just dance. So we dance a couple, and then I said, okay, you want to talk? She said, dance two more. I said, okay. And then she said, I got to go now. I got a ride waiting for me. I said, all right, so I said, let me walk you outside. So I walk her outside. It's cold, snow's coming down. And Carlo, the girls, pulls up. She opens the door, turns back to me and says, I hate you. Gets in, slams the door, car pulls away. <laughs> and I'm standing there. Well, that couldn't have gone worse. And I thought, well, hell with it. I'm just going to go home. So I did the 13 mile drive home. And as I'm driving home, I'm thinking, actually, it could have gone worse. The worst thing she could have said to me would be, I love you. Then I had to break up with her for the fourth time in a row. Um, but it's just stupid teen stuff, you know. But but it got me thinking about, you know, the what ifs. What if she wouldn't have? What if I wouldn't have seen what happened to her, you know? That uh, and so that it ended up being a very good story. Um, the second one is the I ninety four murders. In this one, I became sort of obsessed with a, a case that wasn't solved. And uh, the reason I felt it wasn't solved is because I felt they had the profile wrong. That. Uh, in uh, the clinical profile, they felt that the person had was probably in real estate because he seemed to know the area as well. And my belief is was that he might know a little about law enforcement, but he's probably worked a rather mundane job most of his life. Probably single during most of his crimes, raised by a neglectful mother, absent father, probably witnessed sexual abuse at a young age, and he probably has a small penis. And uh, so when my editor read that, she says, what is wrong with you? <laughs> um, but one of the things we don't talk about much is that the way a crime is committed tells you a lot about the person who committed the crime. For example, I've never been to a homicide scene that was cleaned up where the murderer didn't know the victim well. Strangers don't clean up crime scenes. And so when I get there and I see that it's cleaned up, one of the things I know right off the bat is whoever killed that person knew them well. Um, and so you, from profiling, from doing enough cases, 
you start picking up on patterns and things of that sort. And with regard to the small penis thing, when there's a lot of overcompensation in a crime, when someone keeps doing things over, like for example, this case, he's breaking into houses, he's tying up women, he's uh, sexually assaulting them, and he's making himself something to eat. And then he's calling them back in the next couple of days. He's sending letters to investigators. That's overcompensation, overcompensation. So I wrote this, and then I created a unique way of solving it. I mean, uh, four months after the book was published, the case was solved. My profile was exactly right. Um, he was raised by a neglectful mother. His father was worse than absent. Not only did he leave the family, he started a new family and named all the kids the same names for the kids in his first family. It's like, what a terrible person who does that, you know? And uh, he saw his sixth sister get sexually assaulted when he was seven years old by two adult men. And uh, he has a small penis. Um, and they solved it exactly like I solved it in the book, which is interesting. Um, the third book, Last Call, um, is about a 19 year old who was kidnapped after leaving a convenience store in Brainerd. And it's an interesting case because uh, um, I write my book chapters from first person. So some are from the investigator's perspective, most are from that. Some are from the victim's perspective and some are from the offender's perspective. And I have an advantage that a lot of authors don't have is that I know how offenders rationalize their behavior. I know how they think, I know how they justify things. And so you get that perspective when you read those chapters in my books. Also, I've counseled people who have been victims of kidnapping and I know how their thinking changes over time. And so you get an understanding of a case that you wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise have. Um, lying close. This is, a, um, and I use the same investigator, John Frederick, because it's my own weird obsessive personality. Um, so lying close, he sent to look at a, a hunting accident in rural Minnesota. And while he's looking at the accident, he realizes that not very far from there, there was a home break-in. And uh, there was also a teenage runaway who disappeared. And then he starts realizing maybe they're all symptoms of a larger problem in the area. And uh, it gets to be a very interesting case. Also, someone very close to the information, close to the investigation is leaking information on it. And that's why I gave it the title line close. One of the things I do in my books, so the, the case is accurate, that you know, with the events that happen in the case. Um, the, uh, I also include accurate Minnesota history. And so in this case, I look a little at the racial his history in St. Cloud. A lot of people don't realize this, but the first mayor of St. Cloud, Sylvanius Lowry, was a slave owner. He moved from Kentucky to St. Cloud and was elected mayor and he had slaves with him. Um, there was a woman named Jane Swisdown who wrote for a paper called the St. Cloud Visitor who criticized him over and over about this. And eventually he got some vigilantes and they threw her press into the Mississippi River, but she didn't stop criticizing him. Then the Civil War broke out. So Lowry took his slaves and went back to Kentucky and then Jane Swisshelm took a job with Abraham Lincoln writing for the press. She ultimately was fired by Andrew Johnson for criticizing his uh, policies, the, the Jim Crow laws, which he allowed to pass, which is legitimate criticism. Okay, so that area where he lived was, <laughs> eventually became an area for poor Irish and poor German immigrants. And now it's an area they call Somaliville in St. Cloud because there's a lot of Somali immigrants living there. And one of the things I would like to point out in the book that there's always been bad people who had it bad living in that same area, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. And uh, um, the other thing people I'd like to point out is that the first, the only governor that ever came from St. Cloud was uh, Stephen Meyer, who was an uh, abolitionist, who was very anti-slavery. And even though the first mayor was a slave owner, people, most people in the area were very anti-slavery. And that's, and you have that type of mix in every community. That still today, you, know, you have political stuff where you have people with different opinions. Okay, burning bridges. So my first books, and each book gets a little more popular and it's really nice. 
So I am an investigator. My books are real popular with investigators because they love that all the forensics are correct. Um, he comes walking to me with a box load of information. And he says, I have this murder mystery um, that I would like you to write. He said that I've read your first three books. I think they're great. He said, this is a case that is, just has a lot of interesting terms in it. Um, and so in that box is not only all of the police information, but they had an undercover DEA agent investigating this person. So there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about, about this person that I had access to. So a Bemidji State College student decides to look for her biological father. She was raised by a wonderful mother and stepfather. And after her mom died, her mom made her promise that she never looked for a biological father. After her mom died, she decided she was gonna look him up anyway. So she hires John Frederick to help her. And so he looks this person up and finds out that he's a psychopath that's been living in St. Cloud for 20 years. And it's a crazy criminal history, but it's true. And so I put it in the beginning of the book, this, his history is accurate. This is exactly, and it's just, the guy was obnoxious everywhere he went. I mean, he fired at houses, he was abusive to women, he uh, did things like, like would stand in, uh, he drove a co uh, convertible Corvette, would stand in the seat and yell in the drive through windows at teenagers who were working because he wasn't getting his food fast enough and people complained, he would expose himself to them. It was, it was just obnoxious. Even, I had to laugh, even when he went to the dentist, the dentist reports that after he left, there was pop missing from the fridge and the CD was missing from the boom box. It's like, okay, do you, is, do you have to be a criminal everywhere, every aspect of your life? It's, 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 it's insane. Um, but what's interesting about the case is as he's presenting this crazy history, he gets to 2017 and says, and that's it. And Jesus, what do you mean that's it? He says, nobody's seen or heard from him since. And uh, it gets to be a very interesting murder investigation because in most investigations like these others, you're developing a suspect list and, and people who could possibly be suspects. With this guy, Billy Blaze, her dad, there's like 40 people who wanted to kill him. And so you have to figure out which one actually did. You know that, uh, so it's a different way of looking at an investigation. Um, this one, this is the back of the book. And I just have to tell you a little about this picture because I have, I have fun shooting the cover shots. And so what I did was I had to take a smoke bomb in each hand and just raise it like this. And it makes a perfect heart on a perfectly still day if you go like this up to here. So perfectly still day, I go behind, we go to the dam of the falls because that's where I wanted the cover shot. And uh, what I didn't realize is that even on a perfectly still day, there's enough of a breeze going through the dam where the, it, the smoke won't sit there. But when he shot the picture, I loved the exp her expression so much, I thought, I'm gonna go with this picture anyway. It's a great picture. Um, so that, that was fun. This, this one we shot on a railroad trestle um, in Little Falls, and she sits on the Mississippi River. What you don't see is that she's 25 feet above the river there. It's pretty wide in Little Falls. And so I'm there with her, her mother, and the photographer. And so Chloe asked me, the model, she says, okay, where would be the best picture? And I said, the best picture would be having you sit right in the middle of the bridge on the bottom trestle. Up here is where the trains go by. And uh, I, I said, but personally, I wouldn't sit there myself. I said, so <laughs> you don't have to go down that road. But she goes out there and she crawls down there and she sits there. And I told her mom, she doesn't have to go sit out there if she doesn't want to. And her mom says, oh, she's a good swimmer. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's a big river. But, but fortunately, all went good. Um, okay, other things I, I, I like to talk about is that I like to, ed, to also provide information on forensic stuff, on new forensic techniques that they're using. Um, for example, in uh, last call, one of the things they use is it's called an electrostatic detection apparatus. I'll come back on film again, sorry. Um, that uh, in the old movies, remember they, somebody would tear a page out of a notebook and they'd have a pencil and they'd go over it and look what they said. They don't need to do that anymore. They have a, a machine with a liquid in it and uh, it'll tell you what things say by indentations in paper. So you can take a stack of post-its where all the above post-its were ripped off. You put it in there and it'll tell you what was written on every post-it above that based on different levels 
both of my new indentations in the paper. The other thing we have is what's called a vacuum metal deposit. And it's that's used in, in this one where uh, we can get fingerprints off of clothing and sheets. And it's almost like a big aquarium glass. So you take a sheet and you put it in there and you melt less than a dollar's worth of gold in it. When gold becomes a gas, it adheres to the oil and fingerprints. And then they take zinc and they melt zinc until it becomes a gas. When zinc becomes a gas, it turns gold black. And then they pull out the sheet and you can see the fingerprints all over it. So yeah, there's some interesting things. Other unique things with investigations is how do you think they get a footprint out of snow? I mean, they can't use plaster like you use on a dirt road. So what they do is spray honey uh, beeswax and one thin layer after another until it gets thick enough and they pick it up and they have a footprint. Another thing interesting about investigations is a dog's nose print is as unique as a human fingerprint. So if somebody tried breaking into your house and your dog attacked the person and they catch him and then say he's still wearing the same clothes, if there's a dog's nose print on it, they can say it was that dog that attacked that person. Um, in uh, burning bridges, they use a device called an MVAC. Um, we, we've got wonderful ways of solving murders today. Like DNA is, has been, uh, you know, it's freed a lot of innocent people. So DNA is important, but DNA disappears relatively quickly in nature, unless it's secured somehow. So if you have a situation where let's say somebody wrapped the body in a tarp, I'm not saying you should do this, but, but and uh, you take a rope and you tie it. If that rope has nylon or is anything that you'd use for boating or anything like that, very likely there's DNA sealed in that knot because killers sweat. And uh, when you're pulling it tight, it's sealing that, that DNA. Um, the problem with getting DNA off a rope is it's porous. So it's not all concentrated in one area. So what they created was a small vacuum cleaner, they call an MVAC, which sucks the DNA off that rope and pulls it into a filter where now it's all together. And then you can get a DNA read. So like I said, there's a lot of interesting things. Um, what do you think besides DNA has been a big thing with helping solve crimes? Any thoughts? Ancestry. Ancestry, yeah, that's been great. What was that? The internet? Oh, yeah, the, the internet. Uh, <laughs> people give up a lot of information on the internet. For example, I'll just give you, I was just recently interviewing a 21 year old who had sex with a 15 year old, and he was telling me, I didn't know how old she was. And then tell her, really? I said, because you texted her on such and such a date and that she said, I'm, she texted you and said, I'm 15 years old. And you said, age doesn't matter to me. Oh. And he said, how do you know that? I said, I have every text you ever sent her. That uh, I have that before I go into the interview. And so all that emails and texts, that's when it, when it becomes a court case, that becomes public information that's, that you can use in the investigation. Cell phones are probably bigger than DNA or than anything else right now because it, it puts people in areas that their cell phones are always uh, triggering off antennas. So for example, if you have an Android, you can go back to the history of an Android phone and determine the exact location of that phone at any point in history. And so they've actually used Android phones to show that somebody was at the site where a body was dropped off at the moment that body was dropped off. Yeah, so it's, there's a lot of stuff with that. And the other thing, of course, is cameras that they're using because so many places have cameras now and so many homes have cameras where they're using it to look at vehicles that went by and, and things of that sort. Um, okay, no matter what you do, you gotta have a sense of humor or you're not gonna survive. And people say, okay, where do you get humor in your work? Uh, weird places. Like many of the people that I do assessments on are very narcissistic or very self-centered. In Greek mythology, Narcissus was someone who fell in love with his, with his reflection in the pond and eventually drowned in it because he was so enamored with it. So being a psychopath is not a psychological diagnosis. But so psychopaths typically will get something like narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Um, I was doing an assessment on a level three sex offender, and I thought he was very self-centered, so I gave him a diagnosis. 
And just think about how self-centered people are commit these crimes. Often when we say things that people might take wrong, we worry about it. These are people who are murdering and assaulting people and not caring. You know, think of the level of self-centeredness. So I, I gave him this diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder and he comes back to me. And he said, well, Frank, I know you think I'm narcissistic. I've just never been in a room before where I wasn't the smartest and best looking person. <laughs> and, and so he's trying to, I'm thinking, nail that diagnosis. And he's thinking, this is just the reality of my life. Um, or even things like, I was giving one individual uh, the SOS and intelligence test. And this is supposed to be a simple question. How are a fish and a submarine alike? And the answer is they both go in water. And the guy is thinking for a while and says, ah, they're both sandwiches. Oh I gave him credit, they're both sandwiches. Yeah. Um, other areas, I'll just, just uh, share another one. Um, that uh, I got a call. <laughs> um, they did a big a sting operation in the city and arrested a bunch of sex workers. And this is in St. Cloud. And they have a great prosecutor, Jamil Kendall, and Becky Bales, great correction supervisor. So they get together and said, okay, now we have the sex workers in jail. What are we going to do with them? They said, well, let's send them over to Frank. You can do psych assessments on them. Tell us which ones need drug treatment, which ones need mental health counseling. So I'm going through my voicemail at the end of the day. And I got a message, Frank, this is Becky over at uh, Corrections. I was wondering if you'd be interested in seeing a prostitute. And, uh, <laughs> and so I had a little bit of an idea of what it was about, but I thought I'm gonna have some fun with this. So I called her back and I got her voicemail. And I said, wow, I didn't think it was that obvious. <laughs> um, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll just try to be nice to my wife and see how that works out for me, but I really appreciate your concern. <laughs> and uh, she said she laughed for an hour after she got that. But it's, it's one of those things when you do this job, if somebody's listening on the side, they think, what is wrong with these people that, that you have those kinds of conversations? Also, in my stories, the brother of the investigator has a disability because I, I grew up with a brother with a disability. I know what it's like to keep a brother from being bullied. In this situation with schizophrenia. What fascinates me about schizophrenia is the just the bizarreness that it can have a normal conversation that all of a sudden takes like the weirdest turn. I'll give you an example. I'm walking into the office one morning and there was a schizophrenic individual who sees one of the therapists who works for me. And I said, Hey, how are you doing? He goes, Ah, hangs his head. I said, What? Last night. I was thinking of questions people might ask me today, and I had that one written down. How are you doing? And I thought, nah, nobody's going to ask me that, so I crossed it out, so I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wouldn't have been in a hurry. I'd love to see the questions he did have answers for. Um, or another time, the uh, individual was telling me, he said, have you ever heard that saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? I said, I have. He said, that's exactly what my life is like, but there's no horse. And I said, okay, is there water? No. <laughs> I say, other than that, that's a good analogy. It's exactly like that. But uh, yeah, but so you get that kind of stuff. And I, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, like in the book, one of the conversations he has with his brother's brother saying to him, okay, I can't figure this out. He said, okay, my belt holds up my pants, but my pants have loops that hold up the belt. So who's the real hero here? <laughs> um, but yeah, that kind of strangeness. Just because I think a good story you have to have a little humor, you have to have a little love, and you have to have some thrill and mystery that uh, you can't just have one. I mean, uh, let me give you an example. I like Claire Danes is a great actress. I liked Homeland for a bit, but the last couple of seasons, it just got boring because she was frantic all the time. And uh, there's no buildup then. It's just always here and it gets boring. And if you want to have a good story, it's got to, you got to have ups and downs. You got to, you know that there's got to be times where the reader can relax and laugh a little, and then also have the mystery. And so that's important to me in writing. Um, I also think it's important to have likable characters because sometimes I'm watching the show and I'm thinking, why don't I like this? And part of it is I don't like any of the characters. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So what we should do is a lie detector test um, and show you how this works. So I have an example, and this is what you see in shows and movies all the time, the one that's going across the paper with the ink. They haven't used that for 40 years. But uh, so this is a lie detector test, what it looks like now. And uh, 
What's interesting, it hasn't really changed much other than it's on a laptop rather than this 40 pound clunker that uh, you carry around and you have to, you have to put drops of ink into these things so it keep ink coming out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna hook someone up to a lie detector test. I'm gonna have someone help me hook them up also. And then I'm gonna give somebody a piece of paper and have them write a number on it. And I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, or five, and then show that person the number. And then I'm gonna ask them to tell me, is it one, two, three, four, or five? And I have them tell me no every time. And I should be able to tell what the number is just by looking at the lie detector test. Um, so I'm not gonna be asking personal questions which would result in a homicide or another book. Um, <laughs> We'll try to do something easy, but I want you to, I want people to see how it works because it's it's interesting I, and it really works. I mean, there's a reason why the CIA and the FBI still use them that uh, they had a break into uh, armory in Los Angeles. And what they did was they knew the guys who did it and uh, they knew they didn't have time to get the weapons out of the city, but they didn't know where they were. So they pulled in one of the guys and they hooked him up to a polygon machine and said, I'm not going to talk. And he said, they said, that's fine. They said, are the weapons on from this block to this block? Are they from this block to this block? They went to the city. They narrowed it down to a two block area and found the weapons. He didn't say a word. They just looked at his responses on the machine, which is interesting. Okay, now I don't do polygraph exams. I'm, I'm doing interviews. Um, I have a machine because I own a company that, that does them. And this is one of our older, machines and now I contract with people. For example, Bob Bird from Mankato is one of the best polygraph examiners in the state. And uh, they're over 90% of the time, they're right. I'm right about 75% of the time, but that's why I don't do them. Um, the first polygraph examiner, Dick Plotnick, I just have to share this story because you think of the old dirty Harry Clint Easton movies, that's what Dick Plotnick was like. He was one of those hardcore investigators. And I had him do a lie detector test on somebody. And the guy failed it. And the guy said, the only reason I failed is because it's so damn hot in here. And Dick turns to him real calm. Well, imagine what it's going to be like for you when you get to hell. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So I always enjoy Dick because he's a funny guy. All right, so who wants to volunteer to take a lie detector test? Anybody? Thank you. So you'll have a seat here. Who wants to help hook her up? How about the female help hook her up, maybe? Come on. Somebody. <laughs> Cords all over here. Okay. So this is what we do. These are called pneumo tubes, and they basically measure breathing. I don't know if it's blue this, but <laughs> so this is gonna come across here and here. There's two different ones. So what I'm going to do is I'll have you put around front. Okay, so uh, it's no problem. So let's see. I need to see. Perfect. So I'm already getting reading. Second Lumo tube, where are you? Oh, here it is. Okay, so this one goes up here. So again, I'll let you fasten it. And I'll come around the back here. Yeah. So let's see, let's change this way. Oops. Uncomfortable. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So the next thing we have is what is called galvanic skin response. And that's these things. The right handed or left handed? So we're going to put these on your left hand. So these basically measure sweat. So we're going to put one here. Oh, no, let's put it here. So Basically, you want fingers that, that are probably not going to have calluses on them. So there's another one. Okay. 
And so good, we're getting a read on the nose. And then the last thing, we're going to put a blood pressure cuff. Let's put it on the school. Let me get Is that real loose, the blood pressure cup yet? Yeah, it's still loose. Let me hang on one and try to get us a little tighter. Okay. All right. Um, I would be okay with that. Let's <clears throat> put a card. So, who wants to write a number on the card? One, two, three, four, or five? Anybody? I'll let you pull the cap off, being not so good at it with one hand. Okay. So, write it and, and show it to her, but don't show it to me. Okay. Let me know when you're done. Okay. All right. Okay, so what is your first name? Jerry. Jerry. And where do you live, Jerry? Madison Lake. Madison Lake? Okay. So I'm going to ask you, is your name Jerry? And you say yes. I'm going to ask you, do you live in Madison Lake? You say yes. You can only ask yes and no questions on a polygraph exam. And I'm going, then I'm going to ask you, is the number one? You say no, two, no. So you say no to every number, okay? And try to look as straight ahead as possible, okay? Is your name Jerry? Yes. You live in Madison Lake? Yes. What's number one? Is the number two? No. Is the number three? No. Is the number four? Is the number five? No. Ah, this is the hard one to read. <laughs> mm -hmm. Was it number two? No. What was it? It was three. Three. So three is this one. That's where the basically you're looking for variations from the norm. Um, the problem was, is I should have let it run longer. When they actually do a real lie detector test, they ask every question three times. And so, um, and the polygraph examiners, if you want to start taking this stuff off, thank you. The polygraph examiners I use, they go one to 10 with the numbers, and uh, they always get that right. And they're, they're sitting there with a person, they said, okay, the reason I did this with you is because I want you to know that I'm going to see what it looks like every time you lie to me. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Sometimes, you know, I, I like 
that you use a that we can use a polygraph exam. It's not a big deal to me that you can't use them in court because I'm more interested in just getting an idea of some information helping with an investigation. Um, sometimes I think you just have a battery with a light on it because a lot of times when someone's denying an offense and we come in and say, okay, that uh, we're going to hook you up to polygraph machine. They see the machine, you sit in the chair, and they say, okay, okay, I did it. And I never have to hook them up to the machine. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Jay. It is interesting. That was that was good. And that, like I said, I should have probably I should have let it run longer for each one. And uh, it's funny, there was there was just too much of a variation with too many different numbers. Um, because I thought about I, I thought about three also because it was a, it was just different than the rest of it. And I thought, nah, I bet you it was one of the first ones, but yeah. Um I do have to tell you this because this is a funny story about it. So Dick Plopnik was a pretty hardcore investigator, and I knew him for years before I finally got this story that uh, um somebody who knew Dick said, Tell him about the first time, have Dick tell you about the first time he testified in court. Well, so he finally told me, he said, Dick said he was just, just got married. He was working as an investigator for the VCA, and they offered someone training to do polygraph tests. And it's done in either Alabama or Texas. And he thought, I'm going to go and do this. So job security, you know, that he, that he has ability that somebody else doesn't have. So he got the training, and he said, when I'm down there training, this is like 50 years ago, he said that one of the things they told me, if you're doing a polygraph on a teenage boy, and you want to see if your machine works, just ask him if he masturbates because he'll always lie and say no, and then you can see what it looks like when he lies. <laughs> um, anyway, so he said, so I got the training. He said, I returned to Minnesota to do my first polygraph test, and they got called in by the governor. And the governor says, I want you to do a lie detector test on someone for me. And he said, I'm thinking about this as a homicide, is this a sexual assault? <laughs> and he said, um, a neighbor kid cut a tree down in my yard. You won't admit it. And he says, "I'm thinking, are you kidding?" And he says, "Okay, but but he, he said ultimately he's my boss." He said, "So I said, okay." So I do the polygraph, and he said, "The team fails that he's obviously lying." Well, you can't use a lie detector test in criminal court, but you can use it in civil court. And so the governor sues the family to replace that tree in his yard, and so it ends up going to court. And so Dick says, here I am, I have to go testify. He said, at this point, it's the only polygraph that I've done. And he said, and so I bought this suit to testify. And he said, it, you know, it was a good deal. It didn't fit exactly right. And uh, he said, you know how the old courthouses are with so many of them have where you step up the steps and then you get into that, you're almost in a little bit of a cage, you know, where you're testifying. He said, so I step up the steps and he said, I'm just sweat. You know, I've never testified in court before. And he said, I'm sitting there. And he said, the guys I work with in the back are going like this. I'm thinking, oh, I must be doing a good job. And he said, what they were trying to do is get me to sit up. He said, because I was sitting way back, and you could just see the top of my head over the railing. <laughs> and uh, he said, so I'm there, and this, this defense attorney is just ripping on me. How many polygraphs have you done? One. And he said, well, you mean one besides this one? No, just this one. <laughs> and he said, so he's just making me look like a fool, and just, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have any experience. And he said, then the attorneys, I thought he was done. He says, goes down, he's about to sit down. He turns back to me and he said, and by the way, did you ask this boy if he jerks off? <laughs> and he said, I tried to start explaining it. They said, no more questions. They wouldn't let me answer. And he said, then I really felt like an idiot. He said, so I started stepping down the steps. And he said, my pants was a little too long. I stepped on my pants, I fell off the rails again, landed on the lap of the jury. <laughs> and then he had to walk out of the courtroom. <laughs> and so I tell young people starting their careers, you can make serious mistakes and recover from them because he became one of those great investigators. Yeah. And uh, without well, such a great start. Um, okay. So just to share a little information, people, questions people ask me, what's one of the weirdest interviews you've ever done? One of the weirdest interviews that I did was in St. Cloud Prison. If you've ever driven up Highway 10, you see those big black walls along Highway 10 by the prison. So I get there and uh, they kept bringing me downstairs. I've been to every prison and jail in the state. So 
And I thought, okay, something's going on here. They bring me to a room that's all cement, gray cement, wall, floor, ceiling. The only thing in the room are two chairs facing each other and uh, a metal plate about four feet square bolted into the floor with a chain coming out that like you'd pull a car with. And they said, have a seat. We're bringing the guy you're going to interview. So they bring this guy in with shackles on his wrists and feet, orange jumpsuit, and they sit him in the chair across from me. They take that chain and wrap it around his shackles and put five master locks in it. And they said, okay, are you comfortable interviewing him now? And, and uh, I said, well, I got this guy on two rape charges, which I typically do without even being handcuffed. And they said, well, they killed a gang member yesterday. And I said, I guess I'm comfortable interviewing him like this. <laughs> and then and so we spent the afternoon talking. So yeah, definitely some of the weird things about my job. Um, questions about any aspect of it? Yes. I have four questions. Yes. <laughs> How did Albert Ames beat the, the lie detector test? I do not know. I'm not, not familiar with it. Do you watch um, fictional crime shows? Sometimes. I was, If I had to recommend a show, I like... Uh, Mayor of East Town with Kate Winslet. It's out now. That's really good. That's probably the best true depiction of an investigation. Mayor of East Town. M A R E. Mayor of East Town. Yeah. Oh, um. So, what do those shows get wrong? Okay. Uh, one of the biggest things they get wrong is they get evidence back too quickly. That evidence just doesn't come like that. DNA typically takes months, and it's not because it takes that long to process. It's because there's such a backlog. For example, when they finally caught the Golden State Killer, it took four hours to get the DNA processed. But the reality is in, in most homicide cases, you're waiting months for that information to come back. Um, other things they do, there's, there's so many things that when I watch a show and I try not to say anything because I don't want to ruin it for everybody else, but they're holding someone with a rifle towards someone and the person's not talking and so they rack the rifle. Okay, you never see a bullet come flying out of it. That uh, if that, if that rifle is loaded, when they rack it like that, a bullet should come flying out of it. Otherwise, they've been aiming an empty gun at that person the whole time. Um, something they do in law and order every couple of months, two homicide investigators go into the workplace and uh, um, to talk to a guy, the guy's loading boxes on a van, and the whole time they're talking to him, he continues to load boxes on the van. I always think, who has a job where homicide is so common, you wouldn't stop and talk to two homicide investigators if they came in to talk to you. That, uh, yeah, so some of that stuff, but like I said, I try not to say anything and and because uh, I don't want to ruin it for other people who are with me watching. <laughs> um, yeah. but some shows are pretty good. Um, if you want to really learn about profiling, there's a show called Mind Hunter about John Douglas. That uh, John Douglas was the first, first profiler, and I actually spoke to him when he was still alive in California about um, profiling cases. Yeah, yeah, very good. I studied with Robert Hare, who's the world's expert in psychopaths from Toronto, Canada. Um, Robert Hare, H-A-R-E. And so Hare wrote a book called Without Conscience about psychopaths. But uh, he developed what's called the PCLR, the Psychopathic Checklist, which you can use to test to see if somebody's a psychopath or not. And I was just recently had to do that type of assessment last week. Um, but one of the things Robert Hare told me, which I thought was interesting, he said, psychopaths don't beat lie detector tests. And he said, what's, what's funny about it, because he's the world's expert on psychopaths. He said, when I tell people that, nobody believes me. And he said, the reason they don't believe me because it's been hammered in their heads and movies and shows. And he said, but it's simply not true. Um, that sometimes you actually have a schizophrenic person can beat a um, lie detector test if they believe the delusion is real. Because in order, what gets caught on the lie detector test is when someone knows they're lying. But if someone felt that aliens were trying to kill him and they really felt that and gave him a lie detector test, they would pass it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's some interesting stuff with that. I will have to tell you this. this is, when I asked for questions, one of the funniest questions that uh, I got was in Stillwater when I was speaking there. Um, a woman asked me, Okay, did you hear about that pervert in Minneapolis who was breaking into houses and rubbing women's feet and sucking on their toes when they're sleeping? And I said, actually, I am familiar with it, so I can't talk about it. And she says, I'd have paid him $200. <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 
Um, well, partially, the, partially is in the definition that uh, um, if they were bad at it, they would maybe caught when they were teenagers or young men. And the fact that they're a serial killer means they've been getting by with it for a number of years and subsequently they're older. One of the things that isn't true is that sometimes you see in shows that serial killers are predominantly white. They actually aren't. Um, that's not true. But uh, yeah, so there's some interesting things. The other thing is that last year was a bad year in Minneapolis. There's no doubt about that with homicides and things of that sort. But prior to that, the 1980s and 1990s, there were way more homicides than there were in the 2000s up till last year. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why that was, but for example, when you look at like 2018, 2019 in Minnesota, there were, and, and nationally, there were seven times as many serial killers in 1980 as compared to those years. Um, the other thing I, I, that I find interesting is I'm, I'm, and you'll see this if you read my book, Statistics, it runs through my head like this in all cases. But uh, sometimes people talk about, they'll talk about uh, a disappearance or a homicide that happened. There was one in my community back in 1970, and people say, well, the reason it was such a big issue at the time is because that kind of stuff didn't happen then. But you actually go back at the statistics, it did happen more often than it happens now. <laughs> it's just that it didn't get the publicity it gets now. And that's the big difference. Sometimes you got to be careful that just because things are in the news and you get a lot of attention doesn't necessarily mean they're more prevalent. That uh, it just means they're getting a lot of attention. Yes. So do you think that there are more shootings on the time that happens when they get the attention? Well, like I said, Minneapolis is a mess right now. They're just there's too much going on with weapons and lack of enforcement and things of that sort. That uh, And that's gotta be fixed. But I, I do think that there's some people who like the attention. A, a lot of times it's just self-centered, immature people. You know, uh, The biggest reason one person kills another is narcissistic injury. That somebody said or did something that they can't forgive them for. And so they've gotta respond because that's of their own ego. You know, that's the reality of it. And that which is sad, and that's it. we end up doing a lot of education of people on those issues. Other questions? Yes. You deal with children too. We um, we have therapists who do some. We do more with adolescents than children. Yeah. And by the way, I believe psychopaths are made, not born. That uh, uh, you know, I mentioned before about. Um, when you look at some of the way a crime is committed, that you can look at, the, um, it tells you a lot about the history of the person who committed the crime. When I'm doing an assessment on somebody who's suspected of a crime and they're denying it, I never let them talk about the crime to start with. That's what they always want to do. They rehearse the story 20 times they want to tell you. And I just say, yeah, I don't care about that. And then I just start, let's talk a little about your childhood. And so we talk about the childhood. I talk about um, the medical history, I talk about what school was like for them, I talk about their friendships, I talk about their history of relationships, we talk about um, work history, um, all kinds of stuff. And what's interesting is when you finally get to the offense, it makes sense. That you see the way things develop throughout their childhood. I'll give you an example. You got a guy referred to me who's accused of um, assaulting prostitutes in Hampton Avenue in Minneapolis, denying the offense. So I don't let him give me a story. I just say, okay, let's just talk. So we get talking about this child that grew up in a home where uh, parents had a lot of parties, not a lot of discipline. He saw a lot of things he never should have seen. Um, when he was 12 years old, he got a job working in a truck stop where he was cleaning outside. And uh, the, some of the mechanics there thought it would be funny to have a prostitute do some things with him. He didn't want to do it, so they held him down and he cried while she did these things with him. And then he kept working there because he was too ashamed to tell anybody. And they teased him about it all the time. So he becomes an adult, what does he do? He goes down to Hennepin and Lake Streets and starts assaulting prostitutes. You know, that when you get through the history, it doesn't justify what they're doing, but you understand it. And that's, it's, it's, that's always the situation. Um, anyway, on a lighter topic, 
everybody here knows people who can be great characters in a book. And uh, people who do weird things and say weird things, I have to share this one with you that uh, in my book last call, I make reference to a guy I refer to as Ray Ray. So I grew up in a small town, and, but there was a lot of guys named Ray. And so they gave them each their own moniker. So there was a guy they called Ray Eight for a while. Well, first they called him Oktoberfest Ray because he wouldn't go up to it after the harvest. And then they called him Ray Eight because Oct is a German. And then eventually they just called him Ray Eight. Um, there was another guy that uh, uh, Ray Loscheider who had the unfortunate circumstances when Jennifer Lopez changed her name to JLo, everybody called him Ray Lo. Um, but, uh, but then there was this guy we called Ray Ray. And we called him Ray Ray because he always repeated himself. Um, but uh, he, was, he was one of those guys who was like bullshit a level above everybody else. And always in a hurry, mechanic covered from head to toe with grease. Um, I, in this convenience store, I worked in some on weekends in high school. He'd come in there and he'd get a microwave sandwich by the time he got to meeting and his, his hands would be clean. But, uh, yeah. He'd come into a bar and he'd say, give me a beer, give me a beer, gotta go, gotta go. And uh, the bartenders would be busy. He'd look around like, ah. so he finds somebody sitting at the bar with a big 16 ounce glass of beer in front of him. And he'd come up to him and say, you know, there's a trick I could do. And uh, they talk about it. So well, what is it? He said, I can swallow an entire 16, 16 ounce glass of beer in one swallow. And people they'd have a discussion on it. No, nobody can do that. That's not possible. And races would say, look, I don't want to take your money. Let's just bet a quarter on it. Okay. So Ray would pick up that glass. He'd start drinking it. It'd take him about 12 swallows, but he'd finally empty it, put the empty glass down in the bar and say, I guess you're right. And give him a quarter and walk away. <laughs> but uh, yes. Well, I was just wondering, you talked about before getting that, uh, just that box of data mm -hmm. from, from the, how do you sit down as an author and I suppose as a forensic psychologist, we'll put those two together to create a story out of all of that data that you've got in front of you. Well, because one of the things I'm looking at when I'm looking at a crime scene, I'm just thinking about, okay, the odds are it would be this type of person in this situation and this, you know, that, and, and, and so you started playing with that. And uh, as a matter of fact, in last call, that, uh, that crime was solved by just taking a look at a database and figuring out that it couldn't be a lot of people. And because uh, not only is it could be, you, you can also eliminate people based on things. And then finally you get it down to a number that's small enough. And you realize now you really got an investigation in run. And there have been some cold cases that have been solved that way, um, including that case. Um, another situation. So, um, I have a brother-in-law who uses words incorrectly with total confidence all the time. And uh, sometimes it's close, so it's, it's kind of humorous that way, but sometimes it's not close. He, so he owns this gas station and uh, it's a small town and people, if someone comes in and they're gonna give someone a ride, they'll give someone a ride who's headed in another direction anyway. So he's in there talking to someone, he's telling them about all the drones he has. And uh, so after the guy leaves, they say, you don't have any drones. And he says, yeah, I do. You know, those little cement guys. <laughs> and I said, okay, those are gnomes. Those are drones. And anyway, but sometimes it's not close at all. And now let me give you a good, a good example. And he uses words and makes up words, like I said, with total confidence. So there's an older person that left and uh, was headed a couple blocks down. A younger person came in and he says to the younger person, hey, would you mind giving him a ride? He's a hermaphrodite. Well, a hermaphrodite is someone who's born with a penis and a vagina. And I know for damn sure my brother-in-law doesn't know what that word means. <laughs> and uh, so after I got, they left, I said, okay, that guy has a penis and a vagina. No, morphinite. And I said, that's not a word. Well, he eats oranges all the time. It was, he eats oranges all the time. And I thought, diabetic? Yeah, that's what he is. <laughs> and I was just thinking about the guy who gave me a ride home. I said, well, I knew that about that guy. Um, but that kind of stuff. So but it just, it, it's fun, you know, kind of working things in or weird circumstances like uh, in the I-94 murders, there's a, actually a gas station in a small town called Buckman where not only can you get your car filled with gas, you can get a tan and a haircut. 
<laughs> and I just think about who pulls into a gas station. Thinks, well, maybe I'll get a haircut while I'm here. It's just it's just an odd combination. But actually, including some of those real things, weird facts, stuff about Minnesota, I love including that in the books. Um, other questions or comments? All right. Um, so with my books, if you go through those communities, their actual places, you'll see those places and, and get a get an understanding of that. Uh, I uh, sell the books, I always forget to say this, so I need to say this, for $15 a piece, or I have uh, any three books for $40, or I actually have, a, I call it the murder cloud, my first four books wrapped in crime scene tape, I sell for $49, but uh, if people are interested in those. Um, any other questions? If not, I'm gonna, and one, one of my favorite things is when I'm interviewing people, is when people use cliches and sayings incorrectly, and people do that all the time. Like, uh, for, for example, I was interviewing one person, and he was saying, you know, you really do, shouldn't throw stones at people who live in glass houses. And I was thinking, what is that saying again? Well, the saying is people who live in glass houses shouldn't cast stones. But I guess you shouldn't throw stones at people who live in glass houses either. Um, but uh, this is my favorite. So I'm doing an assessment on a young woman, and you've all heard the saying that uh, work like you don't need the money, uh, dance like nobody's watching. She said, yep, my mom always said, dance like you don't need the money. <laughs> I was thinking that's a whole different visual. Thing. Anyway, thank you for your time. If anybody's interested in books, I have cash and credit cards.